Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your racing daredevil hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we've got you covered. Today we picked two wildly different little shows for you. First, I will take a look at a post apocalyptic world plagued by monsters and the giant moving fortress Decadence, which houses the last surviving members of the human race. After that, John and I invite you to take part in a turbulent race across America with a plethora of wacky cars and even wackier racers in Apare Ranman. Sounds like a trip worth taking, so don't pause the pod. We'll be right back. In the not-too-distant future, 90% of humanity has been wiped out due to the advent of strange creatures known as the Gadol. What remains now lives inside the Decadence, a semi-mobile fortress that collects a substance called Oxion from Gadol, which allows for humans to survive in the tanks of the fort. Known as tankers, the humans' primary work is to support Gears, the military force that fights against the Gadol. Only a few tankers ever become Gears and get to join the main fighting force called the Power. Natsume, who lost an arm and her father in a Gadol attack as a little girl, dreams of becoming one of those fighters. She is, however, rejected, presumably because of her artificial robot arm, and when she graduates from school, she's sent to work as an armor repairman after she spends five years cleaning the outer walls of the Decadence under the supervision of her new and very stern boss, Kaburagi. Disillusioned, she tries to make the best of things when an accident during a Gadol attack changes everything. Cleaning armor looks like it may turn out to be the least of Natsume's worries, as truths about her world start to come to light. So yeah, Decadence is an original anime series, not an adaption. Counts 12 episodes and is produced by Studio Nut. Huh. Uh, gives a whole new meaning to the term No Nut November. A pretty new studio <coughs> that was founded in 2017 and so far has worked mainly on Saga of Tanya the Evil and Fully Cooly Alternative. The director of Decadence is Yuzuru Tachikawa, who also directed two of John's and mine's personal favorites, Death Parade and Mob Psycho 100. Mm. And the animation of Decadence is pretty damn great. The color palette of the show is vivid, the character designs are incredibly distinctive and varied, and their faces and body language are very expressive. The landscapes of the wasteland that Earth has become look vast and impressive, and the gigantic fortress of Decadence itself, while being super crazy since it's basically a giant fist to fend off the more giant-sized Gadol versions with a metal-as-fuck falcon punch, has a lot of detailed and realistic-looking and moving mechanical parts in and on it. The fights are also a highlight, since the soldiers in this show use a kind of hover device, which looks a bit like, I don't know, um, like a bit of the small cauldron or something. And yeah, that device lets them move around freely in the anti-grav fields the uh, Gaddle put up for defense. So you get a lot of Sin and Punishment 2, maybe-esque, flying around monsters, um, mm. escaping their attacks, shooting darts at them, or ramming giant spears into their bodies to extract the Oxion. And since almost all of the Gadol are CG animated, you get to see a lot of crazy camera work when the gears start attacking them from all angles. Plenty of good Sakuga in this one, even though sometimes you see the seams when one character turning their body looks a bit too wonky or the camera doesn't move enough to conceal certain limited animation frames. But aside from these super negligible bits, this is a great looking show. Also because of another reason, which I can't go into yet because it's a spoiler, but we'll get to it. The music is also great. The soundtrack was done by Masahiro Tokuda, who also did a soundtrack for Sengoku Basara End of Judgment, King's Raid and Last Hope. And it sometimes has a PSO-ish feel to it. We'll talk about why that fits the show very well in a few minutes. And the killer OP, Theater of Life by Koromi Suzuki, is definitely one of my faves this season. The writer for this show is Hiroshi Seiko, who also wrote the script for Mob Psycho 100 and did the series composition for that one as well. 
Uh, he actually does a lot of adapted scripts and worked on a bunch of other stuff as well, like Attack on Titan, Seraph of the End, Vinland Saga, Dorohedoro, Banana Fish, Ajin, uh, Killer Kill, Kakegurui, and currently Jujutsu Kaisen, to name only a few. And the story of Decadence is probably the most interesting thing about the show, all the cool fights aside, but... To properly talk about it, I have to spoil a big reveal that happens in episode 2 of the show. So, if what you have heard by now has your interest peaked enough to want to check it out, maybe skip to the next review. You have been warned. Alright, 3, 2, 1, spoilers, go. So, like I said in the beginning... And this is basically set up as uh, like this post-apocalyptic kind of maybe Attack on Titan-esque thing where not much of humanity is left. They're traveling around in the decadence. The decadence is fueled by Oxion. Oxion they get from the Gadol, so they have to go out, collect it from them. A lot of people die, yada, 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 and come back. And they try to survive in the decadence. Yeah, and then we get this girl called Natsume, like I uh, said um, before in the summary. And she wants nothing more than to become basically a gear or, you know, join the best part of the gears, the power, where her big idol um, called, I think Kurenai is her name, who is like the strongest fighter who was a tanker first and then became a fighter in the gear forces, in the power. And she wants to become like her and wants to become the strongest there is. And, um, you know, she lost her father to a Gadol attack and, you know, wants... To become a strong fighter in her own right. Uh, but yeah, she is assigned to basically become an armorer. And first spend three years in, as someone cleaning the outside shell of decadence from muck and gadol guts. It's a great job in super high altitude. So it's also very dangerous. And her new boss, Kaburagi, is very stern and uh, says, yeah... Um, it's nice and all that you want to become a soldier, but there's no use to it. Give it up. There's a certain system in our world and it works like that and you can't go against it. It just doesn't work. Let go all hope, <laughs> ye who enter here or whatever. And he's very resigned to that kind of thinking, even though Natsuma tries her best to have him, you know, reconsider that and maybe uh, try to help her get into the actual fighting force. But yeah, those two ideologies clash with each other on occasion and then you know once we're introduced to that kind of there is a giant swerve happening right at the very end of the first episode mm. uh, where suddenly the art style of the entire show completely switches and everything becomes very cartoony and we witness a weird assembly of we don't know what it is aliens cyborgs robots what is it no idea and a weird computer voice says, thanks for pay taking part in this story event of Decadence. Uh, see you again soon. And then the episode ends. And it's like, what? <laughs> what is happening? And yeah, the next episode makes pretty clear what is happening. So Decadence, it's not just a giant fortress. It's an MMO, basically. And not an MMO played by humans. It's an MMO played by cyborgs. Because... As it turns out, humans polluted the Earth until everything fell apart in the latter half of the 2400s, kinda. And the Earth became inhospitable. Governments and nations ceased to exist and corporations took control. Huh. Mm. How very timely. And since corporations want to keep control and want to manufacture and, you know, everything, they built cyborgs as an all-purpose workforce because also the human population was dwindling at that point and, you know, they need to keep work up. And the cyborgs, of course, as these stories go, took over when humanity drove itself basically to extinction. And the biggest corporation that is still left is Solid Quake Corporation, who then purchased ownership to the rest of humanity <laughs> at some point. <laughs> yes, it is as grim as it sounds. And created Decadence as an entertainment resort for their cyborg workers. So basically, all the cyborgs employed by Solid Quake Corporation, with Kaburagi being one of them, indulge in this, let's say, entertainment a relaxation program kind of. You know, here... Uh, you have to work all day and we want to keep you happy, kind of, or keep you not getting frustrated. So we give you this MMO, which you can uh, indulge on. And they do. Basically, 
the gears, all the gears pretty much, are artificial bodies created for the cyborgs. And they can basically hack into them, you know, jack into them if you want to lock in and then play this game with them. Uh, for the cyborgs, there are not really any stakes. Well, kind of. Because if your character, if your artificial character dies in the game, in decadent, so to speak, they're dead and you have to start over. So the cyborgs are basically playing an MMO in permadeath hardcore mode. And there are even fucking microtransactions for cosmetics in this garbage game. The gears are pretty much all weird outlandish rainbow colors. That's how you can pretty much tell them quickly apart. And they can purchase these different colors and a bunch of other and weapon, extra weapons and stuff like that. You know, like, like a M- free-to-play MMO might work from the store of Solid Quake Corporation. And then they can use it in the game, quote-unquote. So, of course, they get just you're basically beamed down to Earth, kind of, or into uh, the host body on Earth. Yeah, okay, so the cyborg bodies might die and then you have to get a new body and have to start over again. But there are actual humans living in this world who think this is all, you know, this is their world and this is not all manufactured. And they die for real. And they think this is the life they have to live. (laughs) So this is all very fucked up. And Natsume kind of falls a bit outside of this because she was declared dead by the system when her heart stopped beating for a while after the attack where she lost her arm as a child. And so she is what the system would call a bug. And bug needs to be eradicated. The super asshole guy who is basically the main antagonist for most of the show, Hugin, is basically always saying death to all bugs or all bugs must be eradicated or stuff like that. So yeah, that's, that's kind of mantra because bugs mean problems or potential problems. And they are a risk to the status quo. And the status quo needs to be kept up to keep the workers distracted from their mundane lives and keep them happy and keep them working. Because if they don't do that, if they don't have the distraction, the cyborgs might rebel. They might realize that they are stuck in this shitty system uh, set up by the corporation. Because it's a shitty system, not only for the humans, also for the cyborgs as well. They just fucking chip away at very mundane bullshit tasks every day. And the only thing that basically keeps them entertained and not mad is this game. And it's, it basically also works like a drug, kind of. There are a lot of, <laughs> of obvious metaphors to drugs and everything in this show, downright to the Oxion that uh, is also the fuel for the cyborgs. And every time, you know, they do very well in, in decadence and everything, they get an acceleration of, uh, of the uh, Oxion, very high-grade Oxion that is very... Tasty and apparently feels very good, puts them in like this very exhilarating st- state and everything. So, yeah, it's pretty obvious what the show is going for here. It's like, hey, giant ass companies trying to bewitch their workers uh, to keep them working and abusing their power and killing people for it. And yeah, Kaburagi is one of the cyborgs, as we learn in the second episode. He kind of looks like Kamen Rider X8, which is weird comic booky, big, bulky, or, well, also super deformed state. All, all these characters look very cartoony. All the cyborgs look very car- cartoony. By cartoony, I mean from a Western cartoon. And very cute, partially. Very, very cute designs. Very weird. They sometimes look like fairy tale creatures, sometimes like animals, or sometimes just like robots. But it's all very interesting and all varied. And Kaburagi, like I said, has resigned himself pretty much to his fate. And the reason for that is he was one of the top-ranked Decadence players and then got one of his teammates basically, um, well, helped him become a cheater, turned off his limiter because it turns out you can turn off your limits as a cyborg, but it's prohibited. It's considered a bug action. And the teammate, Kaburagi, told how to do that too. Basically uh, got himself, you know, got himself dismantled by the system for what he did. And that's the that's message that uh, echoes through all of the show. Uh, you are property. Uh, the cyborgs are property, the humans are property, and everything belongs to this giant ass company. And since Kaburagi doesn't really see a way out of this, he decided to not try anymore. And he basically does dirty work for the company now, which is hunting down for uh, defective chips in the human bodies, which the company uses to monitor the humans and basically to control their fate and their actions. 
And if such a chip malfunctions, Kaburagi is one of the people who hunts down those buggy chips and extracts them from their hosts. And then the humans die, basically, or they die because of the chips, because the chips malfunction. And yeah, he is right in the process of doing that when uh, Natsume catches him, mistaking it for Kaburagi stealing money from an unconscious person. And at that moment, he's like, oh, shit. Natsume caught me, so the system will recognize her as a bug now, as a problem, and she will be immediately terminated by the system, because that's the usual procedure here. And nothing happens, because the system registered her as dead, like I said before, uh, when she uh, lost her arm and momentarily her heart stopped beating in the attack as a child. So she is not in the system. She is not part of the system she is basically not even uh, noticed by the system, whatever she does. And that's basically when Kaburagi realizes that she is his chance of redemption. She is his way to rebel against the system and to make good for what he did to his, um, to his teammate. Because it's not really clear, but it is alluded to that Kaburagi did what he did to his teammate intentionally, maybe, to get him either killed or found out by the system or into trouble because his teammate was basically catching up to him in the rankings and Kaburagi was maybe afraid to lose his status as a top scorer or something and that's why he did what he did and told his teammate how to cheat, which is a shitty thing to do. But Gamers, uh, am I right? Yeah, game, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, and he is full of regret. He is very angry with himself. Apparently he's... And he sees Natsume as his chance of a redemption to, to redeem himself, basically, in his own eyes, as well as, you know, maybe in the eyes of the friend who uh, he did what he did to. And he basically helps Natsume. He trains her. He helps her become a gear, which she does. He upgrades her a robot arm. She becomes like this super badass pole arm fist. So basically like a miniature version of the giant fortress. And she becomes super adept at uh, using the anti-graph gear. And the first time you see her really unleashed on a Gadol during an attack, it's a sight to behold. Like, she goes all out and it's super crazy. It's super satisfying to see her kick ass in a really wild way. And uh, this is probably one of the most Sakugai-heavy moments in the show. And it's just, it's really great to watch. And yeah, that's basically the rest of the show. Kaburagi trying to turn Natsume in this really powerhouse, and then at a certain point realizing that there's actually a way to bring down the system with her help. And, you know, it's always emphasized that she is the... She, by the system, she's considered a bug. She is something that shouldn't exist. But he always says that, hey, no, she saved my life because he was ready to kill himself, it's, which is also made very obvious in the show. Um, cyborgs run, uh, live a very long time, they have, like, at uh, least 175 years of working time, I guess. So you can imagine working for 175 years in the same company, doing the same shit. That might, <laughs> that might drag you down. Uh, but also, you know, uh, that can apparently be extended maybe through Oxion or something. But when we meet Kaburagi and get introduced to what his character has gone through in the past, uh, he is basically ready to not use another canister of Oxion anymore and not to prolong his life. There's this warning in his, uh, in his HUD, in his screen, that says, like, running out of power, please refill your Oxion supply. And he deliberately chooses to not do that because he's sick of the life he lives. He hates what he has become. And Natsum is the one who puts him out of there because her unwavering determination to overcome the system she has been put uh, on, even though she doesn't know the full extent of how much her life is being controlled by the system and how deep this rabbit hole goes and how dark it becomes, she is not willing to give in. She's not willing to give up, even in certain parts when Kaburagi tries to keep her from actually uh, engaging in the fight because he realizes that she might die and he doesn't want that. He sabotages her gear and everything, but she won't give up. <laughs> and that spirit is what pulls him out of his misery as well. So these two grow stronger and stronger together. They, Of course, they have their troubles and their skirmishes here and there, character-wise. But by the end, they're this indomitable team. And they're really great together. And it's fun seeing them evolve next to each other. And yeah, I thought 
That was probably the strongest part about this show, at least to a certain extent, their relationship. And it's the main focus. There are some other side characters in the show. And, you know, some of them have bigger spotlights, but a lot of them are only there maybe for plot purposes. There's not that much character development to them. There is an interesting parallel between one of Natsuma's friends and one of Kaburagi's friends, who basically are the symbol for someone who wants things to stay the same, because they also have resigned themselves to their fate. And when one of their friends, you know, for Minato, it's Kaburagi, for Faye, it's Natsume. It's like Natsume and Kaburagi both want to rebel. They want to try to get out of the current situation. They want to overthrow the system. And both Minato and Faye, each on their side of things, one for the cyborgs, one for the humans, it's like, that's, I, I'm going to distance myself from you because this is not what I wanted. I, I only was helping you because I wanted things to go back how they were. And for Minato, it's like, hey, I want to fight with you on the battlefield again because that's what we did in uh, in our past and i had a really good time and it helped me get through my life and for Faye, it's like i want to hang out with you again that's i want to go shopping with you and all this fighting stuff is like it scares me it's not what i want and it uh, it shows me things i don't want to see so it's really interesting to show a parallel there both from the cyborg side of you but also from the human side of you which i really liked but aside from that there is not that much Great characterization there. There's some neat story bits between Natsume and Kurenai. Once Natsume gets to join, uh, join the power and Kurenai becomes her superior and everything. They have a cool thing going on. Also Kurenai and Kaburagi because she is super smitten with him. Definitely got the hots for him. Probably because she doesn't know that he is a robot. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's kind of cute. So she's fun too. But you know, they're all very obvious side characters and there's just a bit of character development here and there and it's nothing too special so the biggest part is natsuma's path through the story and of course kaburagi and kaburagi also has like this cute little pet gadol he kept which is kind of like his first act of rebellion against the system it's that thing is called pipe it's this weird squishy buck dog thingy <laughs> it's really cute and that's like the first thing that shows you that hey he might not be the stern really uh i don't give no fucks guy that uh you you uh, maybe pack him as and yeah overall i just liked where the story was going in terms of what is alluding to and what a nice twist it puts on the you know trapped in the game playing the mmo formula and how effectively and all encompassing that is weaved into the story threads of this show like when the decadence is sent to a gadol nest it is treated like a special event in mmo by the system and the machines there are trailers for new upcoming main story quest events like that like you would maybe see when a new patch for final fantasy 14 rolls around or a new episode of pso2 might roll around and then when the storyline the system came up with demands most of the current gears which includes Natsume at this point, to die in a climactic battle for old heroes to return, because that is the storyline they wanted to create for, for the cyborgs to get ba basically to the next patch. Kaburagi has to sabotage the narrative. He tries to stop Natsume from going, but it obviously doesn't work because she's very intent on doing her part in defending decadence. But this is one of the very many moments where you see like how the system works. And for this game to continue endlessly, the world has to be kept in a perpetual state of never-ending war with the Gadol. Like the circle has been repeating for hundreds of years. There have been several storylines and several different decadence fortresses, in fact, because there are some ruins in the land here and there. And people are like, hey, this looks like old parts of decadence or something. And no, it's just an old version of decadence because it, from an older version of the game, basically. People will die and the story reboots. And Gadol are bred for the purpose of the game alone. They are not a natural occurrence. They are bred by the Solid Quake company to keep this game going, to keep the status quo in place and keep their workers happy which is incredibly messed up and to quote a guy on twitter i follow with uh, the handle purple gaff this obligation to protect the status quo at the cost of what are considered to be lesser lives by the system is actually the world we're currently living in <laughs> what the fuck yep. why is nobody watching or talking about this show and i have to agree it's all very resonant considering uh, recent times and yeah 
this is one of the things I really liked about the show. It trying to do these kind of things with its story by using a very familiar trope, which is play the fucking game. And like I said, becoming a top rank gives the cyborgs a feeling of being more than a replaceable cock in the machine, which is kind of an addiction to them, uh, which is also a clever commentary. So yeah, all of that is handled pretty damn well. And I, I liked I liked the cleverness of it and how it approached all that stuff. And, you know, seeing those two different art styles might put some people off. Um, it's kind of weird switching from a very realistic looking fantasy as steampunky show to a very cartoony style with the cyborgs. But that was also kind of refreshing and keeps things interesting visually. I also love how Kaburagi changing the storyline by defeating a, an Alpha Gadol makes the two robot devs who are responsible for developing and bug fixing the game freak the fuck out. <laughs> because the, base, the, the follow-up Gadol threat is basically still in beta, <laughs> which is very <laughs> clever. Like that, that creature is not finished yet and they literally say <laughs> it's in beta or something like that. It's really cool. It's like, fuck, we're not done yet. Shit, 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 shit. We can't, we, we can't start the event yet. <laughs> we're still in beta. It's great. Although I gotta ask, if this is basically an MMO action game, where are all the teenage kid robots throwing racial slurs your way? I <laughs> couldn't, I couldn't see them in this show. There were, there were none. I guess the profanity filter must be pretty good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe profanities are not allowed by the by the system. That would fit the bill, yeah. But yeah, I thought the show was pretty damn cool. I think the only thing that really disappointed me is that Natsume doesn't really have an important part in the final set of battles or story bits, really. She's more of an onlooker, uh, and I wanted her and Kabu fighting side by side. But she serves more as an inspiration than a real facilitator of the victory. It's like she is there and she's also part of what Kaburagi needs to do to overthrow the system. But she's not really that important. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like aside from motivating him to do it. Like he needs her literally in one scene to pull a lever together with him. And that's kind of it. That's all she does. She doesn't really win an important battle or something like that uh, against uh, a superior foe or shit like that. She doesn't really really have an important part in delivering the final blow. She and uh, Kaburagi don't really fight back to back or something like that. And I was missing all of that. I was expecting all of that to happen. But it doesn't really happen. So that was kind of a downer at the end. I wanted her to play a more pivotal role in what is happening uh in the finale and didn't really get that so losing a bit of steam at the end there's a show kind of a bummer but until that point i really enjoyed it and i think it doesn't drag it down too much so that i came away from the show or the, the final episode of the show being like oh this ah, this was a this was a total downer by the end it's just a bit right that you could have done more you could have done this a bit better it's kind of sad that you kind of forgot about your best character <laughs> It's like, what? Mm -hmm. hmm. You put so much time into her in the beginning and then you kind of forget about her in the end and don't give her anything interesting to do. It's like, what? Hmm. That doesn't track. What, what are you doing? Like, I, we know what Kaworagi has to do and we know everything about him and we know most about Natsume. So let those two do the cool shit together now and uh, don't really do it. Like I said, there's some other cool characters in there, and I enjoy pretty much all of them. Although, it was also a bit of a lame thing that the one character you immediately, immediately peg as the... Oh, that guy's gonna become a traitor. Of course, becomes a traitor. Mm. <laughs> it's like, okay, maybe, maybe surprise us with the... Don't make the guy who looks like a literal snake a fucking snake. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> Fucking, I don't know, lizard. More a lizard, I guess. Yeah, but <laughs> that's what he turns out to be. He's that weird-ass guy, that fucking lizard-looking guy from Lord of the Rings 2. It's like, mm. of course he's a bad guy. I mean, look at that guy. <laughs> don't want to <laughs> don't want to give it to prejudice, but holy shit. The show could have surprised me there a bit more, and it didn't, which is kind of a bummer. Although... His ending is very satisfying. And so is the ending itself of the show, like how the story wraps up. It's a, it's a pretty satisfying ending. The only thing 
that bothers me is like the few episodes that come before it in terms of what it does with Natsume, which is really not that much. <laughs> and it's like, eh, okay. Kaburagi, Kaburagi is cool and everything. When you had this other super cool character that you could have done more with. Eh. But that's it. Aside from that, I had a super fun time with the show. It's not long. It's only 12 episodes. And yeah, I recommend you checking it out. If you want to do that, it's on Funimation in the US, on Wakanem in Germany. Oh yeah, speaking of Funimation. Uh, Sony, who own Funimation, apparently now acquired Crunchyroll as well for $1 billion, which seems kind of nuts. Uh- did they acquire them or were they in the process of? I, that didn't seem really super clear. I thought they were already. I saw tweets saying they are looking to acquire them. And I saw tweets like they have acquired them. Like as it's, it's a done deal. But I'm not sure, really. <laughs> so I don't know what the current state is of that. Yeah, everything that I've been seeing is Sony Nears acquisition report Sony to buy Crunchyroll for $957 million. And there's like... It's ridiculous to think that Crunchyroll is such a big company at this point. Well, I mean, I think Crunchyroll's parent company is AT&T and they oh. were looking to sell them off. And if that's the case, well, then I guess... Uh, Crunchyroll and Funimation are going to be reunited under the same hood once again. Yeah, I guess. Maybe you see those two platforms sharing libraries on a grander scale in the future again. or I mean, they used to, and then yeah. the deal they had, they just sort of broke it off for reasons. Yeah, but, you know, if it all belongs to Sony now, you know, mm. it should make it easier. Or it all becomes Funimation, or all becomes Crunchyroll, or Funny Roll, who knows what will happen. I mean, this also starts to bring up conversations about monopolization. Uh-huh. But, you know. yeah, of course. Yeah, could give Sony a giant monopoly on anime licenses. But yeah, it's pretty interesting. Well, can, you can talk to Disney about that in movies. Mm, yeah, uh, not really a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, everybody. I have things to say about monopolies. Yeah, it's not a good thing. Hey, and so does the show. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is very fitting. Uh, but yeah, John, I remember you not warming up to the show in its first two or three episodes. So what, what, what was your hold up with it? I got to the second episode when it was like, oh, hey, the world is a reverse VR MMO. And I was like, I'm sorry. Okay. It's a wild twist. It's a wild so, twist. So, I mean, everything you say that happens after that sounds really good and really interesting. But I got through the third episode and I was like, I, I can't cross this hump. I'm sorry. And I just was sort of out. But it sounds like I slept on the wrong show. Maybe, yes. Uh, it's it's fun times. But I can see why you would have, you know, it's it's a really big, it's a really jarring twist not only in terms of story but also in terms of visuals it's like the, like, it's like really at, you start a second episode or, or you blink at the end of the first episode because like what was that and then you start yeah. the second episode and you're wondering wait did i did i did i start the wrong sh- did i hit play on the wrong show what what is this <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the visual style shift wasn't so much that bothered me. It was just like, oh, it's another VR MMO. Great. I I feel like I've made it my job, quote unquote, to have only one of those in mm. my life. And that, and that one that I chose is incredibly trite and badly written. Look forward to it when we talk mm. about it. <laughs> um, but... I I don't know. I just was like... <laughs> I can see why. But like I said, I think but this show puts a, puts a really nice twist on all the tropes that have been employed so badly by the other show we will talk about <laughs> in a later episode. But then you saying like, oh, hey, Natsume and Kaburagi don't really have a moment together. It's sort of like, oh, that's sort of... Uh, eh? They do have several moments together, just... They all happen before the final battle. There is a lot of character interaction between them, and there's a lot of de- character development between those two. It, the problem is after there's you no, have like, big climax. Exactly. Moment. There's no there's no real payoff. The show tries to do it, but it doesn't. It doesn't really work. Like it's like literally, literally, 
in the final moment of the show, when it's about, hey, we need to fire our giant weapon, blah, 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 to finally extinguish that, that one big threat that is happening, Natsume and uh, some of the other gears try to help assemble or do their part in assembling the, the, the giant weapon on the decadence. And Kaburagi literally says, Natsume, get the fuck out of there. We don't need that. <laughs> it's like... They they get to ninety percent power and she basically only liver, delivers the last ten percent, but they weren't really necessary. <laughs> it's like, mm. okay, um, don't have the show actually say that. Make the show say that they really needed those last ten percent, but that's not what Kamurai says. He says like, we don't, we don't need that. Go away, or you will die. <laughs> it's like, hmm. But, you know, everything before that is gold, everything before that is great, all their character interaction, them clashing, you know, different ideologies, like I said. Mm. Natsume first really not jamming together with Kaburagi's way of doing things and everything, and then her pulling him out of his funk, and then those two working together and slowly becoming a really cool team. The only problem is you expect at a certain point, okay, there's a payoff now. Yeah, Natsume is this badass fighter now, and then you don't let her fight together with the other badass fighter and especially not really that long against the main asshole of the show. Mm. Which is also a bit weird because he kind of just disappears by the end. Gets just reintegrated into the system, I think, or something like that. Or was part of it all along, which makes sense in terms of story, but it's also not super satisfying because he's been the asshole of the show. He's been responsible for all the shit that has happened, at least from a viewer's point of view. And then... You don't really get the satisfying, oh, let both these characters kick his fucking ass moment. They fight him, but again, it's not really that much happening there. So it's kind of, hmm, okay, this is cool and all, but you could have done more. You could have done more. You, you just needed those last 10% to, <laughs> to make this a truly, truly amazing show. And it kind of loses a bit of steam at the end there. Which is a bummer, but it's still a really good show. It's really enjoyable, and my final word on Decadence would be, despite it losing a bit of steam by the end, I still think it's a very cool series with a very unique take on the MMO trope, or trapped in a game trope. It's a story about surpassing your limits and not resigning yourself to the role society has given to you. And though I wished some characters would have played a bigger role in the finale, I was never bored with the show and enjoyed it pretty much from beginning to end. I think it's a really fun time and I recommend everyone watch it just for the sake of, you know, the story doing a really cool thing with some of the things you have seen before in other shows. And yeah, do that. Go check out Decadence. It would have been a maybe kind of perfect show if it had gone the extra mile. It didn't, but still, I think if you give it a chance and try to get over that hump in the beginning with the weird twists and everything, you will have a pretty damn good time. So, we go from a weird reverse computer world to of what is ostensibly the cannonball run. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty for, much. For those you who are up on your movies. <laughs> your um, very old movies. Yes. I feel like Probably. that I feel like that movie is is due for a remake. Yeah, I mean, it's been almost 40 years. It came out in 81. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Fun time though. So there you go. I guess technically the cannonball run in reverse, but whatever. Hey, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Apare Ranman is the newest offering by Studio PA Works, who we've talked about kind of on and off before. They do pretty shows. They do do they do great work. The problem is sometimes their shows are like a big hit and they're like really good, and sometimes they're like, oh, you know, it could could do without. Like uh what was it one show? Irozuku that I started to watch and it felt very sort of tropey and whatever just i mean a fluffy sort of love story but not really all that interesting all around yeah um seriously jaeger was one of the shows that i reviewed by them and uh had again great looking show fantastic animation but the story was like yeah it started mm. promising and it went like completely i don't mm. <laughs> this is all very lackluster yeah, i mean they've also had some 
big hits too like uh angel beats probably like one that a lot of people know one of my favorites is shirobako which is sort of a we've talked about for sort of a romanticized look at uh animation production but you know yeah, it's also yes. it's also grounded in a bit of reality so it's not too far out there um another one of their big ones is hanasaku iroha which is kind of sort of in their same line of the big quote unquote working girls uh saga that they've penned along the way along with a uh, sakura quest but mm-hmm. yeah they've done they've done good work they've done solid work it's just you know it all comes down to a matter of taste i guess don't forget about spider riders oh my god it fucking was <laughs> i don't oh oh man <laughs> Definitely never watched that. So well, they did. They did the uh, animation production assistance for that, so it wasn't technically one of their shows, but it's still in their catalog. So that just jumped out at me, and I was like, "Oh, god damn it!" <laughs> yeah, um, I would venture to say, kind of right off the jump, that Apare Ranman is pretty up there with uh, some of their other really good stuff. No doubt. Yeah. So. What is it even about, besides, you know, the racing thing that you probably would have already gathered? Well, no dream is too big for Apare Sorano, a very socially awkward inventor living in a small rural town in Japan in the late 19th century. Fascinated since childhood by the creation of steamships that can connect people across great distances, he's learned to make machines of all kinds from various scientific texts. His goal is to sail across the sea, beyond the sky, and ultimately to the other side of the moon. Unfortunately, through a string of events, Apare finds himself stranded in the middle of the sea on his mini steamship. Floating aside him is a skilled but cowardly samurai, Kosame Iski, who, had, who was tasked to keep his eccentric behavior in check. Just when all hope seems lost, a large steamship saves them and takes them to Los Angeles. America, baby. Mm-hmm. With no money or plans, they decided to participate in the Trans-America Wild Race, which gives Apare the chance to build his own automobile and Kosame the chance to use the cash prize to return home. However, against rival racers and unknown challenges residing in the wilderness, just how far will this adventure take Apare and Kosame? And, yeah, so... This is a show that is an original. Hey, it fits right in with Decadence. So it's not uh, based on a uh, previous like anime or novel or anything like that. And all of this sort of came out of the head of one Masakazu Hashimoto, who's done a lot of like some episode directorial work on, you know, some things. This is like his, as far as direction goes, this, I feel, I believe is like his big his big like uh his big baby his big creation you know he it came out of his head and he wanted to direct it as well so but he's worked on other stuff like uh, a whole bunch of the crayon shin shan movies full metal alchemist the aforementioned hanasaku iroha and you know uh, some other stuff as well in there and he did some writing on few other shows as well like soul eater not and a couple other pa work shows like haruchika and tari tari alongside misaki morie who's worked on stuff like aikatsu uh comet lucifer which is a show we touched briefly Uh on as well as the ova for blood blockade battlefront which was which is great you know that's a great show y'all should watch Mm mm-hmm and the music was worked on by one Evan Call, who worked on one of your big favorites, oh Big Order. Hey, the music in a Big Order was maybe the best thing. I don't remember, but hey. Oh, no doubt. I mean, he's done a lot of great music work, like on Bodacious Space Pirates, Hakame and Mikochi, Symfo Gear G. Hey, all right. And- as well as Violet Evergarden, so they got a they got a good ass crew working on this show, both on the the writing, the directing, and the music. There's a little bit of one bit of writing thing that again mirrors something in um, Decadence, which we'll get to, or I feel like I will get to. But this is a very wild, colorful, expressive show right from the jump. 
and you just need to look at uh, Apare's hair. Oh yeah, he's got <laughs> out of control red and white hair, <laughs> mm-hmm. and he's got like these little bits of makeup on his lips too. Yeah, it makes him ma- yeah it makes him look like like an oni, like he has this teeth at the side of his mouth sticking out, and uh, yeah. Probably, like I said, probably to give him this this look of a of a dare daring daring inventor who doesn't give two fucks about what you think. So and yeah. he's kind of treated like this this outcast by everyone uh, around him. Yeah. Also, I think he might be. I don't know. I, I'm always very hesitant to assume these kind of things, but the way he's characterized, the way he behaves, especially in terms of reacting to emotional stuff and relating to people and everything. He might be slightly autistic, maybe? Yeah, I sort of wondered about that. But, I, I mean, I feel like they don't... Even though, you know, they call attention to his uh, behaviors and his idiosyncrasies several times, you know, this is also a show that takes place late 1800s, early 1900s. So, you know, it's a time when people didn't really, I guess, really have a grasp on that sort of thing. And I feel like they don't go super hard or get, like, really, like, gross about it. They're just like, oh, that's what he is. That's yeah, exactly. Is. And, 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 I mean, it's a big part of his character development. He comes across as as a dick often in the beginning of the show because he doesn't seem to care about the certain things. But as it turns out, he does. And we see that several times. It's like... No, he just doesn't realize how uh, he doesn't know how to handle certain things and how to react to them. He doesn't have any experience with that, and he probably has been treated badly by his family, so he has been emotionally shielding himself from certain things. So it makes sense that he would act like uh, like this, and also it leads to a lot of great comedy. Him acting the way he does, like the show, humor in the show, is great. But you're probably going to talk about that. But one thing I want to mention: you saying in late 1800s, early 20th century this being in that time frame uh <laughs> there's things the that show didn't still... exist with this tech. exactly <laughs> with the like, tech available pretty much all the cars in in this race are very anachronistic <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they look cool they're very stylized it's just like this can't this wouldn't no not in this form not even remotely <laughs> So, yeah, that's fun times. Mm, but, yeah, um, aside from, well, yeah, the, the the show has quite the cast going on, too. Oh, yeah. So, like I said, we have Apare and Kosame. Kosame is supposed to be Apare's sort of attendant bodyguard. I don't Chaperone. Know. Yeah, I guess yeah. that's probably the best word. He has, oh, he has some things going on in his past as well. He's sort of like a mirror for Apare in that way, in that he sort of keeps it to himself a lot. And it's sort of to his detriment in certain situations. But, you know, he's also... A classic samurai. He's always always looking down on everyone else because of it. Like there's this character they meet in when they get to America, this Native American boy Hototo, and he's always looking down. I'm like, oh, you're just a kid, you know, whatever. But you know, Hototo has his own motivations for uh, getting revenge on this on this big uh, cr- uh, criminal, Gil the Snake. Guilty. Siga, so guilty Sigger, I guess. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess you're guilty if you're a smoker. But um, he, this is an Ike, Ikebukuro Westgate Park crossover, or what the fuck? Close to it, anyway. Mm. Um, but yeah, he he Hototo is very single minded in getting his revenge. But you know, he's all, he's all, he he's a kid, and you know he's not sure how to. He knows what he wants to do, but, you know, he doesn't really have the direction to get there. So when he meets Apare, he's like, hey, maybe maybe this guy who's entering in this race, who's obviously going to, you know, cross the whole country, will be able to help me find what I'm looking for and get my revenge. So he's just, he's sort of there to go for the ride, but he's not... Uh, you know, obviously he's not there without his reason. So I don't feel like he ever feels... He doesn't feel pre- superfluous. Uh, he, and, he, yeah, th- that's a good way to say it. And I mean, he, it's, you know, he 
helps realize Kosama some uh, important things about themselves, help have <clears throat> upper, you know, become more friendly and stuff like that. They both learn to care, care about Hototo and vice versa. And what you said about uh, Kosama looking down on him, uh, down on him, that is, yeah, in the show, in the beginning of the show, it comes very much across like that. But the more you learn about Kosama, it's also like, yeah, maybe the, the way he treats Hototo relates to what he experienced in his past, and maybe he wants to protect him in a way and keep him from the life Hototo is seeking for himself. I wasn't really clear, sure about where his approach came down to in the end, but I could see either way that he is trying to treat him, that he's treating him the way he does to maybe like help him stay a kid for as long as he can, mm -hmm. because, you know, he's experienced different, uh, differently. His life uh, has been different thing, or it, it has been very similar in a way. That, that's a, that's the thing. So he wants to protect Hototo from that kind of, And so that's why he says, like, no, you're a kid. You don't know what you're talking about. And maybe that's it. Maybe it's not. Like you said, maybe it's also like, hey, he's he is a bit of a, you know, comes across a bit stuck up, kind of, mm -hmm. or a bit arrogant. And in terms of his fighting prowess, that is justified, kind of, because he's, despite him being super cowardly, like you mentioned at the beginning, and him being super whiny in parts, he's a very capable fighter. Like when mm. when when he really gets into it, and when he le he really starts fighting, it's great. Like it looks really. I mean, it it looks good as good as the show look can look, because this is not. I wouldn't say this is one of PA Works best looking shows animation wise. Like it has it, its moments, but there are also some like okay, this maybe looks a bit stiff here and there. Some of those fights maybe, but still, like when Kosama goes all out, it looks really great uh, for the when he does that for the first time. And it's like hey, whoa, okay, this guy can kick ass. He's not just a you know, and it's not like he's not the level of whiny like a certain other character from a show called Demon Slayer that really grinding our gears. <laughs> uh, never, never gets to Zenitsu levels of wine. He's always sympathetic in a way. You know, he says a few mean things, but he's never annoying, in my opinion. And he is never... You always feel like there's a really good person under there, and he's not a creep. There is an episode, which was one of my absolute favorites, where basically the cast is just fucking goofing around for the entire episode. And they go to a bathhouse. And that moment could have turned into a super creeper moment, but it's just super funny. So, I won't give it away. But, you know, if Zinetsu was around, that would have been a top-notch creeper moment. Oh, so, God. There you go. And for, Kos for Kosama, that doesn't happen. And I really liked this character by the end. Especially due to a scene that happens at, in the last third of the show. Which is really good between him and Apare. And was really rewarding and everything for everything we've seen those two characters do up till this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty much, you know, the main, I feel like the main crew. But, you know, we have so many other characters and racers. And but we got um, Jing Shalan, who's, she starts off as the pit crew for this other racer. And, but, you know, she wants to enter uh, the race herself. And she shows herself as being a really good, really talented driver. And she sort of earns everyone's respect by being like, Hey, I'm actually pretty good at this. You just never bothered to give me the time of day. So, you know, seeing her break out of that and the box that like the people that she worked for put her in was, you know, really cool. So I was, I was super, I was super, uh, all about her. She's a cool character, and she, uh, she's a capable uh, fighter. Holy shit! She's so yeah. She can. She can. She's a fucking scrapper. That's for sure. And also the moment where she like goes for it and tries to show her team that she's actually good racer is probably the best actual racing the show has to offer because not that much racing in the show considering the setup. Actually, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when this show does the racing part, it's pretty good, but, you know, it doesn't always do that. It's also good when it's not doing the racing part. The thing is, considering the setup and considering the premise and everything, you would expect there to be more actual racing. And there kind of is not. Like, there is some in the beginning, some in the middle, some at the end, maybe, in a way. But it's not the focus. 
the focus is kind of like the interactions between the characters in between mm. uh, those racing things. And the racing is just there for stuffing. That's what it feels like, kind of. I mean, it's still cool, but you would expect there to be more in this show, <laughs> which it kind of isn't. I mean, I guess you gotta... If it was only racing, I mean, then you'd have Redline, which isn't bad. True. No. <laughs> but, you know, this is also a... A 13 episode show where, you know, if it was every episode was the race, it probably, you know, sort of start to lose the the novelty. Yeah, that's true. And, you know, the uh, racing parts that are in there are great. So, you know, you get I guess you get the best of world's worlds. You get cool racing. You get cool action scenes with fighting, everything uh, shootouts. uh you get cool character development and everything. So, yeah, get, there's a little bit of everything in this show, and it all is pretty evenly distributed. So, it works. I just expected this to be like, hey, every episode, we have a big part of the race going on, and that's not really what happens. Uh, so, if if you are, as a viewer, if you are uh, interested in the show and think that it's going to be all about racing and everyone being like, hey, okay, I have to apply a new tactic to to get past this opponent and everything that's not not really happening it's it's more about the the stuff in between and the characters clashing with each other and everything so yeah that's the focus of the show in my opinion that's what it's best at i guess so mm. yeah yeah cuz i mean uh jeez a lot of things happen like there's an episode where part of the uh course gets sabotaged and they either have to dig their way through it or go around it. And mm. Gil, who is out, who we don't know who he is, who, who could he be, is out mm. there sort of twisting his mustache around, as it were. I. So here's the thing, um, dear PA Works. If you want to conceal the identity of your hidden bad guy, don't. Oh my god! Don't cast Kenji Rotsura as his voice actor, <laughs> dude. Dude, it wasn't even that so much when I saw when I saw that character for the first time. I was like, "Oh yeah, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh-huh. <laughs> mm-hmm. Gin Ichimaru returns," which is the parallel I was hinting at from Decadence. You sort of because you said you could see, you know, yeah, the turncoat a mile away. You as yeah. soon as this character comes on, you're like. Uh that being said Gil is a great villain and a genuine asshole and a threatening presence once he reveals himself and Suda definitely has some fun hemming it up so it's a good time the the show in that moment sort of turns from being a show about racing to it's a good old fashioned train heist and it's like yo let's go all right yeah and it's a great shootout and everything and uh, rescue mission and it's yeah it's doing all those things kind of Flawlessly, I mean, not flawlessly, but you know, you, you yeah. don't really notice the problems because you're having such a fun time. Yeah, I mean, say part of it, part of the story comes from where Gil kidnaps. Uh, there's a character Al. He mm-hmm. he's from a wealthy European family and mm-hmm. working that, for the company called B N W. Yes, <laughs> mm. Mm. Bavar- Bavarian. Uh, nothing mm. works. Nobody works. <laughs> I mean, all the all the car companies are kind of uh, you yeah, know versions not... of General Motors is in there, and I think another one other big company, a uh, big automobile company from you know our our reality. Yeah, I think it was like not BMW, not GM, and like not Ford. I think. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yes, there you go. Are your legally distinct automobile manufacturers? Mm-hmm. Um. Yeah, Al has a companion, Sophia, um, and Sophia gets taken by Gil, and that's part of the train heist as well. Um, you have other characters like like Dylan and TJ, who are both, you know, they're both outlaws, but we get to see as time goes on, yeah, they sort of had uh, a rough past with this uh mutual lady friend of theirs and they, one of the big parts of their story is sort of a a coming to an understanding between the two characters it's really good it's yes. really good you see them sort of sort of start to see eye to eye and then um their big showdown against gill is super fucking good yes 
you get the two uh, brothers, Tristan and Chase, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, they, Tristan enters the race under the name of Gil, and he just he's wearing this uh, mask, and he looks all Darth menacing. Darth Vader-ass mask. <laughs> pretty much, and Chase is there to be like, yeah, I'm here with a guilty cigar. We're going to round you all up, and you find out that, no, they just wanted to enter the race under that name to sort of strike fear into uh, the other participants. And it turns out, hey, you know, they're not so bad. They're pretty cool. I mean, they're the bad brothers or whatever they're called, but uh, they're not that bad. And, you know, it's it's fun. This might sound like a super big spoiler, but immediately you know that, no, that's, first of all, you don't make the super bad guy the guy who doesn't really talk and then give him like this weird henchman and also the way TJ and Dylan react to when he enters they they have a shared history with uh, with Gil because they're all part of the 1003 uh, which are these legendary which were initially 1007 7 glorious get it uh, magnificent seven get it uh i know. get it yeah. i get things <laughs> just it's a fucking western but uh <laughs> they are uh, the last three remaining kind of super legendary soldiers uh so they they should know him but the way they react to him entering is like huh because they immediately know it's not gil because they know what gil kind of looks like probably mm. or at least have an inkling it's like that's that can't be gil and it's like huh huh and the audience is also, ah, no, no way that is Gil. And then the other dude appears. Kenji Ritsuda appears on the scene. And it's like, oh, okay, here's Gil. <laughs> and they, to be fair, they don't try to keep up that charade for too long. No. Trying to play you for, for a fool or anything. It's like, hey, immediately there are things happening. You get become super suspicious of that character. And then it's like, yeah, of course. Uh, of course it's him. So... Yeah, that's pretty pretty okay. Uh, the show doesn't doesn't try to to overplay its its hand. Yeah, that's what I was kind of glad about. Like you know, as soon as like I said, as soon as Suda's character comes in there, the eyebrow is immediately raised. Mm-hmm. But um, it doesn't feel like you know they expect you to be like, oh, who would have known? You know, because. It, it, I feel it's like... pretty clear hints that you know the guy who declares himself to be Gil in the beginning isn't Gil, and the guy who is supposed to be not Gil is clearly Gil. So <laughs> yeah, so it's a mis- it's a misdirection that doesn't a hundred percent work, but it's fine because the yeah. I I don't think the, ex- the it's not expected to work by design. I guess the misdirection is mainly in there for the other characters and not necessarily for the viewers uh, who pay right. attention. So, yeah. And it works in, t- in terms of in, 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 in the story, like we in the frame of the story. Dr- we call that dramatic irony. Wow. Ah, okay. Do we now? Okay. All right. <laughs> sure. when, we, when we, the audience, know something the characters don't know. Ah, look at this English major. Uh, anyway. Look how far it's gotten me. <laughs> to 102 episodes, man. Yeah. There's that. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this, uh, this show, even though it, it's, it's a mostly pretty straightforward show, and, you know, the twists you can see from a country mile away, but it doesn't make it any less fun, I don't think. No, not at all. Like, yeah, some of the twists are predictable, some, but some also aren't, and there were some moments in the show I didn't see coming, especially when it comes to uh, the character development of certain characters and how the, uh, they will react to certain things. There were some things that surprised me, and especially the show surprised me with how funny it was in certain mm. points. Like, there's so much great banter between Kosama and Apare, and Upper being like this dude who is just so fucking stuck in his own head that he, I don't know, gets some barber apron stuck to him and <laughs> yes. ends up on a fucking donkey. And it's like, <laughs> oh, man, that episode was so good. <laughs> that episode was fucking fantastic. There's so much more in that episode and in several other episodes. Like, Kosama is really whiny, but he's also really often the butt of the joke because of certain things and how Apare just reacts to the shit he does. And Apare just being super concerned with machines in the uh, beginning, but not with other things, but also not really knowing his place and also not giving a shit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, it's it's really fun to, to watch him. And also, 
these very reserved and deadpan reactions who sometimes almost come as uh, across as emotionless are a really good way to just completely let a scene like explode in a way with comedic you know um effect and uh, Apare does that a lot but once he gets behind the wheel he becomes a literal hype man and yells here we go yeah <laughs> It's really good. <laughs> and it's really fun to see him like completely switch characters because you realize that's his passion. Mm. Creating like this machine that can go beyond everyone's expectations and also shows him new sides for himself and takes him to places he wasn't able to go before. And that's really good. I also like his interaction with uh, with L. It's really cool. Mm. They they become friends pretty much immediately because they both have a respect and admiration for machines and cars and everything even though l in the beginning comes also across as a bit of a stuck-up aristocrat brat and everything but you know you realize there's more behind that and his relation to sophia and everything i think every character in this show got a really good character bit somewhere where it's like there's more to these characters than you might think there's a surprising amount of development in these just in just these 13 episodes and i feel like the strong part of that is like almost every character has another one to play off of and in, yeah. in, and in some situations several characters to play off of and that really helps you know solidify who they are and these friendships that they've made you know on this crazy wild race this wacky race, if you will. Uh-huh. Yeah, they... <laughs> well done. Uh, they they do, <laughs> do some really smart character pairing in this show. Mm. You're right. Where it's like, of course, yeah, these characters would... If they ran into each other, they would maybe react that way. But also, oh, surprise, they don't. They, you know, react a bit differently, uh, differently because there's more to them than you saw on the surface. So, I yeah, character-wise, I have nothing to complain in uh, Parry Run, man. I think mm. the show has... A lot of, lot of, lot of meat on its character development bone. So, yeah, good stuff, definitely. Yeah, so I think, honestly, this is... I don't know if it'll throw Shirobako off its throne for me. It's from one of my favorite PA work shows, but this is pretty close. This is pretty fa- close for me. To be fair, Shirobako caters completely to your interests, so... <laughs> I mean, it also caters to talking about, you know, how the medium that we are indulged in talking about is created. That is true. Sure. So, so you know, I mean, it's the, a it's a it's a two hit combo. It's like, yes. yeah, here, here's this, this here's the stuff John really likes, and also here's some interesting uh, stories about the industry and stuff like that, which couldn't, to be fair, couldn't hold my interest when I watched Shiro Bako because it was mm-hmm. like. This is too close to reality for me. I don't want reality in my anime. <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> hey, did you notice? Did you notice the reference to Shiro Bako? No. Oh, shit. There's an episode where it's just a shot of a street and there's cars going by. And there's a shop called Don Don Donuts. I noticed that shop. But wait, how is how is that a reference to Shiro Bako? Miyamori in Shirobako is super big about donuts and she loves them and that's one of the phrases that she always says when she reaches into a box to grab one so I saw uh, that I was like I was like eh, 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 okay all right you know and, and it's nice. a little it's a little nothing but it's nice yeah it's really cool it's like hey here's a knot if you've seen Shirobako you'll get it and yeah. I didn't see enough of Shirobako to get it so there you go that was a nice inside thing for you specifically, <laughs> I like that. I think that's uh, uh, probably everyone who watched Shirobako fully and also watched this um, will probably notif- notice this and enjoy it. So yeah, good, good, good idea. And it's not it's it's not super winky wink or everything, so that it becomes obnoxious. It's a really nice nice little bit uh, that is put, uh, has been put in there. So yeah, cool, cool. Yeah. That's what I don't know if we really talked about this before. That's one thing I like in like Japanese reference humor is if you get it, you get it. You put that in direct contrast with something like, I don't know, family guy. Hey, Lois, remember the time we went on the death star? And it's like, it's like, yeah, all right, cool. It's a star Wars reference. Whereas this is like, Oh, okay. I see it. Got you. Cool. So I, I like that, you know, when shows do when, you know, shows like this do that, 
I mean, granted, there's other shows that sort of like try to go the extra mile, like as much as as stupid. My love for uh, Nyarlko is a fucking anomaly to me because that's all it is is reference humor, and it should, and by my own metric. It should be bad. It should be terrible. But it just gets a stupid chuckle out of me because I don't fucking know. My my own rules are inconsistent. <laughs> <laughs> At least you're admitting to it, so whatever. Also, I didn't expect to get a, uh, get a pretty damn good Peter Griffin impersonation out of this episode from you, so thank you for that, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> but, yeah, no, um... Opera Ranman is a super good, super fun show. You know, you know, like like you were saying, a little light on the actual racing plot angle for it, but when it's there, it's super exciting and it's super tight. And you know, even though the cars are you know CG, which is probably you know the best choice, they look fine, and you yes. know they animate well enough. <laughs> Apare's car is probably the weirdest looking one because it's basically just a steamship refitted to be a hybrid car. Mm-hmm. But it's but it's cool and it's it's uh suited to his character. Absolutely. So it's it's great. The show is great and it has a lot of uh it has a lot of heart, I feel like. Oh definitely. Yes, there's a lot of heart in this show. It so, comes through through all the characters. Mm, so if you're looking for if you're looking for your wacky race show, look no further because you could sit down and really enjoy the show. It's got a lot of great characters, got a lot of great action. Uh, some of PA works uh, best animation in recent times. I feel like you can watch it on Funimation and yeah, it's just super enjoyable. Check it out. Never a bad time to enjoy some Apple racing. Mm. And that is a wrap on the 102nd episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in our show is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to viat.badcamp.com and check out his awesome work. Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting animebrainfreeze.com for our review index and more. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnyBrainFreeze, or send an email to animebrainfreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a good time and please join us again on our next episode. Macht's gut. So long, everybody. Next time on Anime Break Freeze. The third outing for everyone's favorite level five. Bringing your head to a gunfight. And the climactic final course for the battle of our taste buds. <laughs> <laughs>